All right, so the Pharisee and the tax collector. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed this. God, I thank you that I'm not like that other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, the man went down to his house justified, rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, so Happy New Year, everybody. It's cool. Um, yeah, we have a lot of ideas and plans of what we want to do for this year, but um, before we do that, we want to really come to, with a posture of really being humble before him. Okay, and just want to give you a little snapshot of the road ahead. We're going to be talking about waiting on God. And in waiting on God, there's different aspects of what this waiting uh, will look like and aspects of how we want to be just be moving as a church in. So we have confession, abstaining. So just like saying no to certain things, in a sense, fasting certain things um, so that we can say yes to God. And just waiting, what does that look like? There's different people in the Bible and Scripture that had to spend a significant amount of time, years, waiting for God to speak or to do something. Um, and just awareness of what God's doing as well. And silence and solitude, being able to be comfortable with that. You know, sometimes God is silent, and sometimes God wants us to be silent. Sometimes God, sometimes God wants us to be alone um, with him. And also just the last thing, just letting things end and die. You know, there's a season for everything. And um, to wait for the next thing, but be okay with something ending for a new season. So that's kind of what it, we're going to be walking through and looking at. And today we were looking at Luke 18, uh, 9 to 14. And as it is the beginning of the year, uh, we might have an idea of what we want, you know, 22, 2022 to look like, right? We have plans and ideas of like, okay, well, this year I hope for this. This year I'm planning to do this. Like some of us, we might be planning to get married, right? Some of us. <laughs> some of us might want a new job, right? Some of us want, might want that for 2022. Who's that? <laughs> Someone else? <laughs> well, some of us just like want to finish the school year, right? Some of us just want to graduate. Um, we all have different kind of ideas. Some of us want to retire. I don't know if there's anyone here, but maybe all of us. <laughs> but even more than that, like maybe even spiritually, some of us may just want to see God in a new way, or we may want God to use us in different ways. We want God to just grow this church, not just like um, numerically, but spiritually as well. Um, and we might want to just see this church community grow in intimacy with each other and intimacy with God. And even though those may be good things and those may be, um, you know, on paper, good things that we long for, I think before we do all that, before we have all these goals, we must remember that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And that's from Proverbs 16.9. So before we get preoccupied with resolutions or goals, things like that, just know that. First, we need to come to God. Ask him, what, what does he want, right? Before what we ask what we want or what we want together as a community even, right? Even if we come together and we say, like, oh, we want God to bless this and bless this idea that we have, we should stop before that and ask him, what does he want first? Right? So I pray that we would, as a community, come together just on our knees first, asking him. And 
in January, this is kind of what the theme of waiting on God will look like. Hopefully that we, we don't start this year um, on our own strength and our own ideas, but we'll be looking for his ideas and asking for his strength through us. Okay? You know, for selfishly, I want this ministry to grow. I want um, this greater community within uh, myself and with you guys, a deeper community and intimacy, just sharing our burdens together. I want to get to know you guys more. Um, I want to reach out to this community here uh, in Blatchford. But it really doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, It doesn't matter what I want or what we want. So we need to ask that important question to God. What does he want for this year? And I pray that this month we would just be constantly asking that of him so that we wouldn't be just walking in disobedience to what he wants and just obedience to whatever we want, okay? So as we do that, as we think about asking God that question, as we think about listening to him, we need to throw off whatever hinders our relationship with him first, we can't just go to him with all this, these sin issues undealt with, with all this unforgiveness, shame, and things like that, um, because that prevents us to really be intimate with him. And we can ask and ask and ask, and try to hear and try to listen, try to be close to him. But if all that sin stays in the way, it'll just continue to be a block for us. No matter how hard we try. Sin is sin. And we need to confess that to him and let him wash that away clean before we do anything. And in today's passage, God shows us this posture in which he desires. And it's hard. Right? As we think about um, confession, he, he shows two different people, okay, the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? So in the context of a Pharisee, um, before he's telling this story, before he's telling this parable, Jesus, he's traveling from Nazareth and passing through many places on his way to Jerusalem where he was planning to die for us. And on his journey, he's doing a lot of teaching. He's doing a lot of miracles. He's teaching his disciples with them. He's empowering them to go. Um, not just his 12, but he also appoints 72 others to do ministry too. So this is after all this. He, he's collected his disciples and he brought them with them. He's taught many parables. He's raised Lazarus from the dead already. And he's healing people from leprosy. And he's on his way to the cross to die in Jerusalem. Okay. So if we just look at the Pharisee, in his day, the Pharisee, they were people who were kind of revered or just seen as teachers of the law, okay? And they were smart people, and they had wisdom, and they knew the, the, the word back and forth. And they were leaders. They exercised power, and they had social power and political power and religious power as well. So in the community, they were people who were leaders. And... They are often known as holier than most people, in a sense. So people looked up to them in a way. And modern day example, sadly, would kind of be like a pastor or like an elder, right? Um, pastors definitely aren't as powerful as Pharisees were in the past, because they uh, they were really they were really powerful. They would be able to you know go to the the courts and change laws and things like that and go to the Roman courts and ask for things uh, for people to be executed, you know. They had so much power. That's how they wanted to get Jesus killed, right? So that's kind of an example of a Pharisee. They had influence. Now, if you look at a tax collector, these people were hated. Everyone hated these people. And they were Jews, but they worked for the Romans. So in a sense, they were traitors because they're getting money from the Jews to give to the Romans. And 
They should be for the Jews, right? They should be on the Jews' side. But it seemed like they were for the Romans. And also, oftentimes, they were seen as dishonest. They would take too much money from people, the taxes, and they would keep it for themselves. So most of the time, they were uh, more rich than the average person. And they were known for that. They were known to be sinners. And the audience that he's talking, Jesus is talking to, he knows his audience so much that he knows that everyone hates those people. Right when he said it, they knew. But outwardly, they didn't really look that different, right? They weren't wearing shabby clothes or dirty or anything like that, but people knew. And a modern-day example, you know, it would be hard to kind of think about, but maybe someone who's like, that you would cancel in your mind, right? Maybe like a racist person or some rich politician who lies and cheats and uh, takes money from the people for himself, someone selfish like that, you know? Whoever that might be, just imagine that. So Pharisees, they're kind of liked, right? But these tax collectors, they're hated. I think right now, because we have scripture and we've... um, seen that Pharisees are always often a bad example. But in that time, that wasn't really true, okay? So just imagine these two people. And imagine like a courtroom, okay? So imagine there's a courtroom and there's these two people. There's this Pharisee and there's this tax collector. So in our example, maybe imagine a pastor or someone you respect as a spiritual leader. Okay, there's that guy. Um, and if you were to look at his record, it's pretty good. Okay, And then you have an image of a tax collector, a sinner, maybe a racist political leader um, who's had a sex offending past or something like that. Someone that you would not like. Someone that you would hate. Right? Picture those two people. Most of the time in a courtroom, a defendant is pardoned if proven innocent. There isn't enough um, to prove that that person's guilty, right? And in this passage, it's talking about someone being justified. And by human accounts, the Pharisee in this story would be justified, right? There's nothing, no grounds for him to be Um, seen as guilty because he's done good things. He's innocent. He hasn't robbed. He hasn't stolen. He hasn't killed. And on top of that, he's done some good stuff, right? He's given money and he fasts twice a week. So if that was today, someone in the human courts, they would say, you know, great job, man. (laughs) That's awesome. And they would leave that person and he would be gone, and he would be considered justified. And it's because of all the bad things he didn't do and all the good things that he did do, and that that would qualify him in a courtroom in this world. And the greatest of lawyers could not condemn this man. By human standards, he's an outstanding citizen. And in this story, What does it take to be justified with God? What does it take to have a right standing with God in this courtroom? Here with God, this tax collector, he's justified not by doing good things, not by avoiding bad things, but admitting guilt. Imagine that courtroom where there's this guilty person he admits it, he goes to jail, or he has to do something to make up for it. He's not justified. But in God's courtroom, the person who admits their sin is justified, this tax collector. And when we look at this, just even the posture of this guy, right? 
he's not just saying like, oh God, like I'm a, I'm a sinner, like, and not letting people know about it. He beats his chest. How many of us have done that? <laughs> right? I don't know, maybe Jared or something. <laughs> Oftentimes we've, we've admitted our sin quietly, secretly, and hoping that no one heard it, no one's seen it. But this guy shouts it out loud from a distance because he knows that God is so holy. And he's in this deep anguish because he knows that he's hurt God, a holy God, a loving God, so much that he would beat his chest. And the truth is, though, this Pharisee, although he didn't commit adultery, although he didn't steal or kill, he's a sinner. He's a sinner. Maybe not explained in this story, but each person is a sinner. Everyone. And maybe his sins aren't as public, but his sins are private. It shows here that you know, he looked down on this tax collector. That's a sin. Right? Thinking that he's more righteous than other people. That pride. And maybe that's a sin that we might have. Maybe it's not so outward and uh, loud and wouldn't be in the newspapers. But when we don't recognize that, when we don't bring that forward to God, that's a barrier. That's a barrier to him. So these private sins like pride, lust, jealousy, envy, selfishness, idol worship, even though they don't seem as big, they're there. And we're not justified if we leave them there and we keep them a secret. We're not. And that's what, what God's getting at. This like this Pharisee, he thinks he's justified, but there's so much sin in his life. But because it's private, he's not bringing that before God. He's not confessing them. So he's not justified. He will not admit these fin sins in fact, he probably thinks that he's sinless, this Pharisee. And it's tough because, like, we look at this example and we think, we might think that this is, like, an old problem, but it's, uh, it's something that we deal with now, right? Just the idea of a good Christian or a good pastor or whatever it is. Like, we per we're perpetuating often this... Um, perfectionistic person that has no sin and he shouldn't confess anything or struggle with anything or she shouldn't because if they do you know they're disqualified they're not justified they're disqualified right and I believe that oftentimes church culture perpetuates this a culture of perfectionism and secrecy you know, and we don't want the tax collector. We want a bunch of Pharisees. Yet God says that we are justified by confession. And sadly, confession has become lost in many of our churches, right? It's not a very common thing that we do, confess our sins to each other or to God or take that time to do that. We can go weeks and months without confessing, yet we sin every hour, every, every day, right? It doesn't really make sense. And sadly, often churches, they, they make leaders out of people who are Pharisee-like. It's like, oh, well, they've done this and this and this, and they don't do that and that and that. Okay, cool. They can lead us, <laughs> you know? And um, it's tough because, like, when people become on that pedestal, it's like, we don't want them to confess anything. I remember I was talking to someone, um, this was like during the whole time of like Ravi Zacharias, where he uh, was committed sexual crimes and things like that after he passed away. Um, and I was like talking to him about pastors and leaders and things like that and confessing sin. And he said, I don't 
need to know my pastor's sins or like I don't want him to confess things and I was like man that is messed up a little bit because it's like that just perpetuates that kind of crime crime that will just continue because people don't want to see it people can't handle it but if that's the culture then we'll just continue to be stuck in this Pharisee like non-confessing culture and it's super sad and we want holy people to just hide in their sin. Like, just hide your sin, pretend to be holy, and lead us. And that's kind of what we want. And rarely do we promote people who are like tax collectors, who are saying, I am a sinner. This is what I struggle with. This is what I deal with. And Jesus is my savior. And by God's grace, I can still serve, right? We don't really, really want that. And as we kind of reflect on that, are we kind of perpetuating this kind of culture of perfectionism and secrecy? The two things that Jesus addresses here, actually. I want um, just to take a minute for us to really reflect on our own hearts because you know I could say this stuff, but if we don't do it, then it's, there's no point, right? So I want us just to take a minute, take a moment to just fall on our knees. Physically, just be on our knees to confess to God our sins or just ask him what are the things that he wants to reveal in our own personal lives, in our sin? What are the personal sins that he's convicting us, that he's sending his spirit to convict us? And Maybe we could take a moment to think about that posture of this tax collector and see that as something as admirable. This is something that we should be like, okay? So just take a minute of silence, um, just on one knee or two or whatever that looks like for you, just in surrender and asking Jesus, what are the sins that you want me to confess? And take that moment to just confess that um, on our knees in humility. So why don't we just uh, do that and we'll just continue on after uh, we take a moment to do that. Lord God, thank you that we just could take that moment in humility together, knowing that Supper Club is not perfect. Supper Club sins, we sin. But God, you forgive us. The power of your cross, Jesus. We can bring our sins to you and that your blood washes us clean and the resurrection just shows us that there's a victory in the end. So Lord, we thank you that you've revealed these things to us. Um, I pray that we would be a community that would be forgiving of not just ourselves, but of others, no matter what, no matter what's been done or has been done or what will happen, Lord, that the, your grace for us would extend to others, not only in our congregation, but to those who are outside, those who have hurt us. God, we just thank you that you give us the ability to just, to bring the darkest and deepest secrets to you, sins to you, hindrances to you, and know that they're so small compared to your grace. There's nothing that you can't handle. There's nothing that you haven't heard before. Jesus, in your name we pray, amen. You know, why I ask for us to just be on our knees, I think we have this thought of, like, I think, therefore I am. It's so kind of this, everything is just in our brains. It's like, oh, well, if I think I'm kneeling, then I'm actually kneeling. What is it? No, if, you, if you're kneeling, then you're actually kneeling. Like, we have been given these bodies to physically express spiritual things, spiritual reality. 
Okay? And we have to move and we have to do things with our bodies. And as we do that, we are um, just participating with what God wants as well as he wants to use us. You know, he's given us these bodies as vessels, right? So we use that to worship him. So that's why I ask, you know. And it's not just random. Um, as we think about the power of confession, it's, it's bringing these dark things to light and allowing Jesus to dispel all that dark stuff, okay? And... The more that we reveal of our sins, the more freedom that we can experience from those things. Oh, it's a courtroom, cool. <laughs> but as we, as we do that, like, I want for us, as we can practice confession, to know that it's not just like um, blanket statements that we can do or just being very vague, you know? If we are very vague about our sins, the freedom that we'll experience will be kind of vague as well, you know? But the more specific that you be can, can become, the more freedom you can have from that sin, right? So yeah, I can say, oh, you know, I struggle with pride. I, I wanna confess that I, I, um, I, have, I struggle with the sin of pride, right? That might be good, but if you really want freedom from what that looks like you would explain what that looks like it's like i want you know these per people to fail so that i look better you know admit those kinds of things that are specific to your sin and i hope that this church this community this group of people would be uh safe enough that we can we can say those things right we can go in depth with some of the stuff that we struggle with it's like, oh, well, I struggle with lust. It's like such a very broad thing. But it's like, well, if you can say what that looks like and someone can look you in the face and say that you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, all that weight of that sin is just lifted off your shoulders. So you can say, like, I'd watch porn once a week or something like that, and that's what I struggle with. That's my sin, and that's the reality and someone says that you're forgiven, that is, that is so amazing. And the power of the cross and the power of Jesus just comes much more to life in you. And you'll have freedom from that bondage, much more than just saying, I struggle with lust. So I wanted to just challenge us to, uh, at the end of this, to be able to confess our sins to one another the ones that he revealed to us on our knees. Personally, you know, what are the things that we struggle with personally as, as sinners? Um, but not only that, that we would ask the Spirit to just reveal to us maybe some of the things, our sins of our culture or our church, our community, you know, maybe those, there's some things there that we need to confess as well. And then... Also, just on a broader spectrum, like, what about the sins uh, on behalf of a, the bigger community, like Edmonton or like Canada, you know? Maybe God wants us to confess those things that we're a part of as well. So, I hope that we will be able to just foster this environment of vulnerability, of transparency with each other in this, and know that that's what God wants. That's what Jesus wants. He doesn't want a bunch of Pharisees. He wants these tax collectors that beat their chest, that stand far off, um, that say that, admit that we are sinners. That's actually what he wants, much more so than people who have a good image of who they are um, based on some criteria, you know? That's what he wants. So, and in doing that, Something that's also really cool is that it's not just humbling, but it glorifies the cross. It glorifies the blood of Jesus and the resurrection. Because you could admit anything, any sin, and the blood of Jesus' cross, Jesus' um, body, 
his blood washes it clean, no matter how messed up it is. And that's how powerful it is. It can wash away the sins of this whole room, this whole city, this whole world, no matter how messed up or how dirty or how gross. So when we, when we do that, we can say, Jesus, you are so amazing because your cross covered it all. Your blood covers it all, no matter what. Even the weirdest stuff that I have done, I think about, I'm tempted by, all that stuff. Jesus is so much greater than all of that. And if you think that your sin is too great to bring to Jesus, you don't really understand how, how big he is, how powerful the cross is, how powerful the blood of Jesus is. Because you think it's like, it only washes like a little bit, you know? It washes away those little sins, but doesn't wash away the big stuff that we still harbor deep down. But the truth is, Jesus Christ is enough, no matter what. So I just encourage you guys to, as we come to small groups, groups of three, like biggest this time for sure, for sure, because it might take a while, um, and gender specific, but really just confess the perso personal things that God reveals, the sins that you struggle with and that he wants you to confess to each other. So that this year we can, we can move into cool things that he wants for us, you know? And that he can speak to us without these sin barriers that are all over the place that are in our hearts, you know? And also just maybe some of the sins on behalf of the church, of the, our community. What are the, some of the sins that uh, maybe he's, he's revealing that way? There might be some stuff. So confess that as well. And then also just on behalf of the community, the city, Edmonton or Canada, or just this North American culture that we find ourselves in, confessing those things as well. So I'm going to pray. And... Um, yeah, feel free to grab some communion after you guys confess these things to another. Proclaim the cross over yourselves and uh, the body that was broken and the blood that washes us clean from all these sins that we've just confessed. So let me pray. Father, we, um, we want to confess our sins to you because we want to walk in repentance, turning away from our sin. You know, it would be so easy to just say, like, oh, 2022 is going to be a great year, and God, you give all these promises for us, and you're going to do all this cool stuff. It's like, yeah, maybe, but first we need to come before you and deal with all this junk that is preventing us from walking in victory and preventing us from being closer to you. And you get some of that stuff out of the way. We know that this will be a continuous thing, but let us take this step now in this beginning of this year so that we can really take this beginning of this year to wait on you, to listen to your voice, to hear you, to draw closer to you, push this stuff out of the way. And then I pray that you would just honor us with your presence, with your voice, and that we would just bring all those things to you, Jesus, to deal with. And that we would walk in greater freedom from our own sin and the sins of others, Lord. I pray for these groups. May you, Jesus, just be over them. May your Holy Spirit be convicting sin. May you uh, just make this a place that is safe from the enemy that wants to tear and divide, that wants us to gossip and tear each other down, Lord. I pray against all those things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So yeah, break up into